local root and making use of aggressive NSAC. So the local root, um, it comes from RFC 7706, which describes methods to have the complete root zone locally in your or at your resolver. Um, this gives um, stability, benefits, it makes it a little bit faster, probably. But um, another nice effect of this is that you don't expose data to the root anymore by doing so. So the RFC described a way, it had some configuration example of how to do this in Unbound. They had a setup of um, Unbound with a stop that then told to a authoritative name server that was running on local host. And that is because Unbound itself did not have um, zone transfer support because it was a, or still is, a resolver. But we found this all a bit cumbersome, so we, we did some work there to make it e more easy, which is the odd zone functionality. So this is functionality we introduced in Unbound in version 170, and this basically makes it possible to have authoritative zones um, loaded into Unbound. So you become a authoritative name server, and then either for queries coming from the client, you can answer those authoritatively, or based on your configuration, you can um, use this information for the queries you send upstream. So we implemented this. Um, you can do DNS zone transfers over XFR or the incremental ones over IXFR, and you can do it over HTTP. So that might be nice if you want to distribute your zone over um, over CDN, for example. So for IXFR, XFR, we also have um, notify support, which is nice, but doesn't really work for the root because the root is not sending notifies. And we can um, write the zones or um, use files locally to uh, load into the odd zone. So if we want to apply this for the root, um, you will have a configuration like this. So we say for name, name is dot, so for the root, all the queries that go to the root, we want to use this zone file. Then we have a list of IP addresses for the um, that hosts the root zone. Those addresses have XFR support open, so you can do DNS zone transfers from those IP addresses. Um, we say, well, in this case, we have fallback enabled, which means that if we can't um, use the root zone here locally, we will send queries upstream anyway. In case you don't, if you don't want that, you can um, just disable that. We say for downstream is no, because we don't want to become authoritative for the, the root zone itself. We don't want to start answering those um, delegations. We just want to use them for the queries that we would otherwise send, to send upstream, which is what we say with the for upstream is yes. So queries that otherwise would end up at the authoritative name service for the root now are answered by the um, zone we have locally in, in our resolver. So this is um, what it looks like. Mm. Or at least it's a grab of the queries that are sent out. So on top you see um, a query coming in for apricot.net, a MX query, and all the way at the bottom you see the reply. And everything in between are the queries that Unbound needs to send upstream to the authoritative name servers to be able to get this answer. And one of the queries you see here is um, the query for apricot.net MX being sent to the, to the root. So we're leaking to the root um, the, the name of the query we're looking, uh, that we're trying to resolve and the type. Now, if we would have the root locally on our machine, then you see there are quite a lot less queries being sent out here um, because we don't have to send all those queries going to, going to the root here. We don't have to send them anymore because we have the zone locally. All right, so we don't expose data here anymore by um, by having this in our Unbound instance. Now, although the um, 7706 RFC is only talking about the root zone, we implement it in such a way that you, that it's not limited for the, for the root only. You can also, for example, get a whole TLD locally. Now, whether this is 
desirable is probably a bit depending on the size of the TLD. You don't want to get the whole dot .com zone in your unbound. Um, and also you probably are not able to get that zone because it's not open for uh, zone transfers. But unlike, for example, SE, they do accept um, the net zone transfers. So this is something you could do if you have a lot of queries going to dot .se. And in this case, we also configure a zone file because we don't want to start the whole um, zone transfer process every time we start the resolver again. So that's one way of limiting the um, queries going upstream. Second way is um, by using aggressive NSEC. So um, with DNS or with DNSSEC, which is a way to validate the authenticity of the data right, you put signatures on your records. So you can use those signatures to see if the, um, if the data is valid but you also need to prove that data does not exist in case you give a, a negative answer back. So that is done by, um, by using NSEC records in DNSSEC and we can also use those records to make sure we send less queries upstream. So on top here we have a couple records from our unsigned zone. Um, so after we, we do DNSSEC signing, after we add those signatures, um, we also add those NSEC records here. So we have a NSEC record for apricotdemo.enantlabs.nl. Um, on the left and on the, on the right side, it says albatross.apricotdemo.enantlabs.nl. So this proves that between apricot, um, between apricot demo and albatross, there are no records available in the zone. Um, the next record proves that between Albatross and Zebra, no records are available in the zone. And the last one says, it goes back to the top, says um, between Zebra and Apricot Demo, there are no records available. Now, if we would send out a query for, for example, tiger.apricotdemo, we get a, an X domain answer back saying this name does not exist, and we get two NSEC records back. Um, so the first one, the proves that the tiger dot does not exist because tiger is in between albatross and zebra, right? The second answer, um, the second NSEC proves that there is no wildcard here. So by having this proof, we know for sure this record does not exist. Um, but if we now would send a second query for elephant in this case, we get exactly the same NSEC records back. Th this was first, this is the second. Um, yeah, so a DNS cache usually works based on the queue name and sometimes also the queue type. So if after we query for tiger and we get a query for elephant, we, we will contact, or elephant is not in the cache, so we'll contact the name service again. But since those NSEC records are the same, we could also just look in our cache of NSEC records, see if um, we can use any of those cached records and then decide if we have to send a query upstream or not. So that is what's called aggressive NSEC. Um, yeah, so in that way you can send or make sure you send less queries upstream. Um, in Unbound it's really easy to enable. You just say aggressive NSEC is yes. It's for now disabled by default but I think in the future we will enable it by default. And it is limited to NSEC for now, because you also have NSEC3, which um, uses hashes instead of the zone name itself, so you um, expose less data on the um, name server side. But it's not what we've implemented uh, yet. <coughs> um, I think I'm gonna skip over those. Yeah, so here you see two queries. Um, first, we have the tiger query with a lot of um, queries going to the name server and the reply going back, then the elephant query. Um, and again, with a query to the name server before we send it back. And after you enable aggressive NSEC, you see that we answer the second question immediately from cache. Um, can I take over from here? 
<coughs> okay, so with that, we have basically skipped, uh, not skipped, covered the limit the number of DNS queries, and we're now moving on to the next bit, which is minimize the data um, that is disclosed in DNS transactions. Um, there's two, well, oh, before we do that, is there any questions about the first part? I guess not. Um, so there's two um, techniques that we're going to look at. The first one is called um, ECS, or um, eDNS client subnet. So uh, what this is about is in the original model back in the olden days, um, the resolver was always very close to the client because usually it was basically in the same network or um, uh, run in a net or yeah, basically it was part of the network. Um, so if the authoritative name servers wanted to present different information to a client depending on where, where it is, imagine you are a, a CDN and you want to uh, provide different different um, web servers to a client depending on whether they're in, in Asia or in Europe, um, then what they could use is basically they could use the could look at the address that a query came from and could use that to, um, to deliver different information. Now, as the internet is getting more complex, um, that is not true anymore. So your, your resolver um, may actually be somewhere entirely different. Just the, the obvious case, imagine you're using uh, Google's resolvers, um, then um, that is absolutely not where your query originally came from. It's not a query coming from Google. So um, to work around this, um, the ITF invented uh, ECS, where basically the subnet of uh, the client came from, not the entire address, because that uh, ov obviously is a bit uh, too much, but just um, a subnet of where the client came from is included in the query to the authoritative name server so that it can then um, uh, decide to, to deliver different information. Um, now, obviously, from a privacy perspective, that's not entirely perfect because now suddenly the, um, the authoritative name server gets information that it originally didn't get. So it can now determine where queries came from, even if it's only to the subnet. So in the example here, you see between the resolver and the last one, an LLAPS.nl name servers, it includes the um, slash 24 information about the, the original client. And we kind of, from a privacy perspective, of course, we don't want to, um, to uh, um, expose this. So one option, of course, is um, to turn the um, th this information off. Just don't send it out. That's the obvious one. Um, but if you're not in control of your resolver, then that is not possible. So instead, there is an option to um, to just include a, a prefix of length zero. So specifically what the RFC says is that if you include a prefix length of zero, it means that you do not want your resolver to add this information um, to the upstream authoritative name servers. Unfortunately, um, at least some of the open resolvers don't actually do this. The obvious example is OpenDNS. Um, so that is indeed what you do in your stub resolver. You include it to um, say that the prefix length is zero, and if you are running the resolver, you just uh, turn it off entirely. Um, more specifically, um, what then happens is if the client here includes an ECS of a zero slash zero in their, in their query, um, the resolver will send this upstream. So it will ignore whatever the ad actual address was from the client, will send it upstream and include um, that. Um, now in Unbound, uh, eDNS client subnet by default is off, so you don't need to do anything. Um, we have not implemented the uh, forwarding of the slash zero just yet, so if you're using Unbound in a, as a forwarding uh, resolver, then it, it will not include that information. Uh, Stubby does do uh, include the ECS zero thing if you just add this uh, um, line in the configuration file. So how does it look in practice? Um, in this query, this is the regular query, you can see that um, if we are sending it out to Google, we will uh, include the client subnet um, at the bottom there in the Wireshark um, dump. And if we now send a query to our resolver with this subnet 00, um, then you see here that uh, Unbound indeed 
this RD resolver uh, indeed does not include this information. Um, the second thing is even more interesting, which is a, a technique called uh, QNA minimization. And um, what we have seen originally in the, in the very first drawing that Ralph presented is that your recursive resolver will go to a lot of name servers to find the actual name server um, that it finally event, uh, gets the information from. And, with Q and it always includes the complete query. So what QNAME minimization does is, is uh, the, the idea here is that when you go to, say, the, the name servers for the root zone, um, you don't need to include the entire information because the root zone, you already know that the root zone will not give you the answer back. So what QNAME minimization does is it tries to, disco dis yeah, to discover the name server that is responsible for the actual query by not giving more away more information than you absolutely need. So what it will do is, or at least what the RFC says, is you start out with um, Q type NS, which is the, the query type for finding name servers. And then you start out um, with the minimal label, so you start out with dot, and then you'd always add one more label, that is the bits between the dots in DNS names, um, until you find the name server that you're looking for. So um, to look in practice, this is the original, um, the way that it was done originally. So we're now looking for the quad A record for hello.nllabs.nl. And um, a resolver starts by asking these questions to the root zone, um, which will tell it, no, I don't know this, but here's a name server that you could ask, which is the NL. It asks that question again. It goes to an NLLabs NL, asks the question again, and eventually, because in our case, um, we have a separate name server for the hello.nllabs.nl zone, it asks that name server. So it, it, uh, four authoritative name servers um, get to see the full question um, when really only the last one needs it because only the last one knows um, what your what uh, the, the record actually is. So what we can just do is we can ask the root zone for just an L. Um, we can ask then an L for an nllabs.nl we can then ask an nllabs.nl for hello.nllabs.nl, and then eventually we get uh, we ask the quad A question only to um, the the actual name server in question. So in this model, basically, what you see now is that all these uh, these zones further up, they only uh, get to see the question that they also are going to answer. So you're not um, exposing any information. Um, there is some issues with this approach. One is um, particularly here in the reverse pointer records for v6. You get these very, very long queries. So uh, if you want to uh, query these step by step, then um, yeah, you see that that gets a lot of a lot of questions that aren't actually necessary because ultimately, um, presumably, there might be a name server somewhere in the middle there, um, and to find that one, you ask lots and lots of questions. Um, what also turned out in practice is that if you're asking NS queries, um, then not all implementations actually answer them correctly. Um, so using the NS record here, there is um, problematic in practice. And um, there is also the question uh, for when are we done? Um, so when should you stop resolving, uh, especially say in that, in that very long name up there, if you are if it, the name actually doesn't exist, um, if you do the traditional um, asking method, then it will very quickly become apparent that uh, you can stop here now, whereas if you do a QNA minimization, you technically have to go all the way. Or oh, that's not entirely true, because there is an answer which is called NX domain, uh, which tells you the name doesn't exist and also nothing below that name exists. So technically, if like after the, the second zero there, you get an NX domain, you would know that this is fine, except that in practice, and DNS is 30 years old and it's been implemented by a lot of people in slightly weird ways, um, you sometimes get an NX domain, um, which actually does not mean the names below exist, not, uh, but you need to actually ask, keep, keep, keep uh, asking. Um, this is called an empty non-terminal, um, which is a slightly technical name for a domain name that doesn't have any records uh, attached to it, but uh, there is names below this uh, that do. So in this example here, um, the 
b.nl or labs.nl um, doesn't have any, any records at attached to it, so the name itself technically doesn't exist. Um, but there is a.b.nl or labs.nl, um, which does have records. So if you do this step-by-step uh, -step approach um, and you get a, a NX domain back for b.nl or labs.nl and you stop, then um, you would actually not get the answer that, that you need to get. Which is why Unbound um, does things um, its own way to get this to work. So the first way, uh, the first thing we had was that NS doesn't actually always work. So then we just asked for the A queries, uh, A records, because every name server implements A records. Um, we also stop with QNAME minimization, so with this, this uh, repetitive adding of labels after 10 iterations. And, um, oh no, we stop after four. So we do this label thing for the first four queries because in practice, um, there's hardly any more name servers than that or more sort of the depth of uh, is, is uh, in practice not much deeper. Um, and we ignore this whole NX domain thing. So if we get an NX domain back, uh, we still work, uh, work, work uh, with this way. The exception is DNSSEC signed domains because for DNSSEC, um, the meaning of NX domain is very well uh, defined also because you can test this with the NSEC records that Ralph showed earlier. So you always know whether there is some names under it or not. Uh, and there is a strict mode which sort of follows the, um, the RFCs uh, very precisely, um, which then also would do uh, how it is described. Um, how do you enable QNA minimization in Unbound? Well, you don't really need to anymore in the uh, latest version starting in one seven something something. <laughs> uh, it's enabled by default. If you want to make sure, uh, you just uh, add this to the configuration. Um, and the strict mode that I mentioned, you can enable too, although you probably shouldn't. Um, so let's look at this in practice again. Um, here we have our uh, elephant example again. So if we're now querying for let me see, what are we querying for? I guess the elephant, apricot, demo, and labs and L A record. Then what happens is, as you can see here, it asks um, the uh, root zone for elephant, and then it asks the NL zone for elephant, and then asks NL and labs dot NL for the elephant, and so on and so on. And if you then enable QNA minimization, you suddenly go to down to this, which is the same number of queries, but as you can see, they're all just um, the queries. So uh, the, the dot zone is asked for NL, and the um, the NL zone is asked for NL labs NL, and so on. So those throw a three. So you're um, you're minimizing massively uh, what is being exposed. And I guess with that, back to you, sir. Oh yeah, unless there is questions, of course. There. Is it? Right, so now that we have covered the data minimization part, we can have a look at the um, security part. So um, it's about encryption and authentication here, right? So after the Snowden revelations a couple of years back, um, it became very clear that we as DNS community had to do something about DNS privacy. That's when the Deprive uh, working group was created. Um, that working group had a focus on, or at least a initial focus on the privacy between the stub and the resolver. Um, because that was the easy part and also because there you have most privacy sensitive information because that's also the part where you really can see the IP address of the uh, of the stuff, right? Um, so one of the um, solutions or documents the Deprive Working Group came up with was, or is the DNS over TLS RFC, which um, basically is what it says, do your DNS over a encrypted uh, connection using TLS, which means you will need TCP here, TLS goes over TCP, and the decision was made to um, use a own dedicated port to do this. So that's port A5 853 is for DNS over TLS. Now, if we want to start doing all, all our DNS over TLS, that means we are going to see a shift from UDP to TCP. 
Um, so DNS traffic is, or yeah, is um, mostly done over UDP, which is really nice because it's simple and fast. Um, so if we are now going to switch to TCP, we will need some adjustments in our DNS software to make sure it somewhat matches the um, UDP performance we are used to. So one of the documents that is made, I think, in DNS up is the um, DNS over TCP um, document, which states some techniques that can be used to um, optimize the TCP performance. Um, so one of the things we can do or we should do is reusing our connection. So one of the reasons why TCP is more expensive is because you have this initial handshake, right? You send the SYN, you get a SYN back, and only then you can start sending your DNS query. Unlike when you have UDP, you just immediately send your DNS query. So you, you get another or a extra round trip here. Now, if we would do this um, handshake for every query we're going to send, it means it becomes twice as expensive, or at least you will have two times the uh, round trips. So what you want to do is reusing a TCP connection. After you've done the handshake, you want to keep this connection open and keep on sending DNS queries and accepting responses over this one. Um, but if you do want to reuse your connection, you do not want to um, wait to send a, a next query only after you received your response, because that r doesn't really scale. You, then in that case, you can't send multiple DNS queries at the same time anymore. So what you want to do is um, query pipelining. So basically, you just send a DNS query as soon as you want to have a, or a, when you want to, you don't wait for the response. And this makes it possible to do um, the connection reuse. Now, if we will do um, uh, the, the pipelining, the query pipelining, then this might happen. Um, so we have a query coming from the stub going to the resolver, the initial query. Resolver doesn't have this in cache and will send the query to the authoritative name server. In the meanwhile, because we do this um, query pipelining, the stop wants to have uh, the answer for another record as well, so it just sends that query, the Q query two here, and a um, query for, or a third query. Now the name server for the first query is somewhat slow, or there is something happening on the path there, which makes it um, take quite some time before we get our first response for that query. Now, if the resolver is handling all the queries it receives in order, it means that query two and query three are now um, waiting for a long time before they are even um, handled. Only after we finish the response for the first one, we start working on the second one, then the third one. So there is a, a lot of waiting going on here. So what you would like to have in your resolver is um, out of order processing. So the resolver just starts sending the queries it needs to have to the authoritative server um, as soon as it's, it can. It's not waiting for any answer anymore. So even though the third answer here is at the same time as the one here, um, all the queries are, or the, the, the other two queries are already handled. So this is something you would like to have in your resolver, but since um, DNS resolvers were not optimized for TCP use because there was not that much TCP going on. This was not something that um, that most resolvers were able to do. Um, so if we are now going to look at the, um, the way you can make use of the um, connection reuse in Stubby, it's basically configuring that you want to keep using the connection by setting a timeout. So here we want to keep our um, TCP connection open for 10 seconds. So we only do the, um, the TCP handshake once every 10 seconds, then we continue using this um, TCP socket. Uh, 
Now, in the case of inbounds, we were able to handle those, um, or we were able to keep the TCP connections open, but we did not have out of order processing since version 1.9, which is the one we released last month, I think. So since inbound 1.9, it becomes um, way more doable or acceptable to have a lot of TCP queries. Um, so this is for the queries we get from the from the stop in a month, the, the stop to resolve our queries. We do not uh, yet use reuse sessions for queries we send upstream. It's also not that much TCP traffic in that part yet, but it's something we really would like to do, so we're working on a implementation for that as well. So what you want to do in Unmount, if you want to handle a lot of TCP connections, is you want to increase the um, number of TCP connections you can handle. By the default, I think it's 10, which is very low, so make it a high number. I have 128 here, but depending on the traffic you have, the size of your network, you might want to do it even bigger. And you want to set the um, TCP timeout to a nice large value, so you will keep those connections open. So what Unbound does is um, it will use this timeout to to keep them open as long as it has more than 50% of the incoming num TCP uh, connections available, and after that it will decrease the size to make sure that um, we're not ru uh, running out of um, TCP connections. Um, so another thing we can do, another thing that was also is also in the uh, DNS over TLS or uh, DNS over TCP RFC is making use of TCP fast open. So as I already said before, one of the reasons why TCP is more expensive is because of this initial handshake. Now with fast open, you can. Um, put your data you want to transmit already in the initial SYN um, packet. So this is basically what it um, what looks like. On the first time we connect to a server, we don't, um, well, we, we don't want to put data in there already, or we don't want to allow that because if you use, a, so a benefit of using TCP is that you can't use those um, you can't, you can't use it for reflection attacks. You can't fake a sender IP and thereby send your data to somebody else. And that is because you have this handshake. So if we now would start putting um, data in the SYN without any form of um, handshake, then you again open this possibility for reflection attacks. So for the first query, we don't put anything in there. Then we get a SYN act back from the server with a cookie. And only when we have this cookie, which you see at the second handshake, when we have the cookie, then we are allowed to put data in the SYN. So then the server already knows this client, I, I know this one, I've, had, I've done a handshake with this one. So to be able to use um, TCP fast open, you have to configure it in your operating system. So Linux and OS X by now have support for both client and server. FreeBSD, I think, only has no only server support by now, for now at least. Though I think they're also working on the other side. So if you have that enabled on your server and you want to have unbound with TCP fast open support, you will have to compile it yourself, which um, you can do using those two flags, enable TFO client, ena enable TFO server. And for get DNS, you don't have to do anything. It's enabled there by default. So this is then what it looks like in the Wireshark dump. You see here the SYN packet with a TCP option, so that contains our TCP cookie, and you see that we already have a query in this first packet. So we don't have to wait for the handshake here anymore. Um, what was the part? Yep. All right, so with the TCP bookkeeping out of the way, uh, let's look into encryption proper. Um, let's start by just a couple of words about TLS. Um, so the idea of TLS was 
uh, to provide a um, a layer within the communication that does all the crypto things and all the encryption and all this stuff for you. So that as an application developer, you don't have to sit down and write all these things because most people will get it wrong. So if your protocol speaks TCP, you basically can just move it to TLS extremely easily by sort of moving that layer in between. Um, what it provides is two things. It provides encryption of data. That's sort of the point of it. But what it also does is um, it allows to authenticate the server because just speaking, um, just encryption isn't good enough. Normally you also need to be sure that you're talking to whoever you want to talk to. Um, what it does to do this, it uses digital certificates, um, which is basically just um, a public key with some extra information and uh, being vouched for by some certificate authority. Um, now, there's two ways uh, of indicating that you want to use TLS uh, with an existing protocol. One is you basically just decide from the startup you want to do TLS all the time, um, which is normally by most protocols indicated by using a different port. So if you think uh, HTTP, um, regular HTTP is on 80 and HTTPS is on 443. The other option uh, that is used, for instance, by SMTP is that you start with a um, with a clear text commu uh, communication connection and at some point upgrade it to TLS. Um, the typical term for this is start, start TLS, which is also what SMTP uses. Um, sometimes that's also called opportunistic um, TLS. The drawback of this is that um, you get exposed to a sort of a downgrade attack where uh, someone can just pretend they don't do TLS. Um, so you have to, you have to uh, enforce that they do TLS at some point. Um, so since this is all so easy, why not just do DNS over TLS? And that's exactly what the Deep Private Working Group did. Um, they went for the option with a dedicated port. So um, there's port 853, if you're talking to that, um, that is your uh, DNS over TLS server. Um, authentication, um, there is two ways to do this. Um, uh, or the problem here is that if you think about how this authentication, authentication works in, say, the HTTP case, is that your certificate has to have the host name of the server in it, um, which doesn't work with DNS because you're not talking to, uh, you're not identifying your name server by a host name because that kind of work doesn't work with the chicken and egg problem. Um, so you are, you have to have some other way to identify um, the server correctly. There's two ways. Um, you can say that I'm expecting, so, so uh, sort of we can we can still uh, salvage this mechanism and when you're configuring your name server, you not only give it the IP address, you also say, and also this name server has to use this host name. And the other option is um, basically you configure the hash of the private key um, with your uh, configuration and that is then called the SPKI pin. SPKI stands for server private key, I, I, oh, public key, sorry, yes, of course public key, I guess, identifier. Um, for the first case, you have the same problems that you have with um, web as well. You have to have uh, trusted certificates installed on your system. Um, or you could use um, TLSA, which is a way to uh, identify certificates assigned to a name using the DNS, but then we're back to the chicken and egg problem um, with, T with, with DNS. Uh, there is a solution for that, which is called the DNSSEC chain extension, where DNSSEC information is part of the TLS handshake. But I think that's still not... Oh, so apparently it's dead now. Right. Um, so uh, the difficult bit, if we do encryption, always is those this uh, certificate management. Um, so we need to do some, some uh, command line magic here, which is you can use the OpenSSL open SSL, a command line tool to create a self-signed key, which um, if we're going for the second option with the, with the SPKI thing is completely fine. Um, that's the command line to do this. Um, I guess nobody can ever remember this, so Google will be your friend. Um, the other option, if you want to go for the hostname version, then um, the best way to do this is something like Let's Encrypt. Um, which isn't quite as simple because uh, Let's Encrypt will want to uh, verify that you actually own the domain. So that host name that you see there in the minus D option, albatross.apricot demo, uh, that needs to be the actual host name of your server and you need to be able to run an HTTP service there, which is what the third bot all does by itself. 
um, but you just need to be aware of that. So the easier option probably, like say for uh, just trying this out, certainly is the self sign key. Um, so what we're gonna do is we make unbound and DNS over TLS server. Um, there's two things you need to do. You need to tell it to listen on the right uh, ports, which the two first, first two incantations do. And then you need to give it the keys. So the first one, the TLS service key is the private key. And the second one is the, um, the public key or rather the certificates. And if you have to, if you get from your, from your CA, like a chaining certificates, then you have to, this is actually a list of certificates. Um, this is basically what uh, the server will put into the handshake and present to the client so that the client can then do uh, validation. Um, you have to tell it to not do UDP. Um, and you have to tell it to speak to the upstream still in UDP even if the downstream doesn't do EDP. I guess that's mostly just technicalities. Um, so let's test this. Um, now we can't use our trusted DIG for this because it doesn't actually speak D, uh, DNS over, over uh, TLS. But from the get DNS library, there is a tool which is basically similar. And um, you can tell it to use uh, TLS with the minus capital L option. And minus, cap minus small m tells it to um, verify the TLS connection. Um, and then you have to, so what we're doing here is apparently we went for the option with the host name. So the add option, much like in, in DIC, uh, tells it to use 178.62.200.226 as the name server. And then the tilde and the, uh, the uh, domain name after that indicates that the, the certificate that it presents needs to be, uh, needs to have that host name in it. And then we just do the regular uh, query that we're doing, so 2019.apricot.net, and I'm guessing the A query for this. Um, and as you can see here, that is actually what happens. So there is a TLS uh, 1.2 handshake first, um, and then eventually there's application data, and if you look at, well, you obviously it's encrypted, so you can't see the actual data, but it seems to be working fine. Um, so Stubby does this, of course, as well, because to a, to a degree, that was the whole point of Stubby. Um, so you have to configure your name service. Obviously, that's a little bit more complicated than uh, with the old one. So first, we have to tell it that we want to use TLS. Um, we, want, we tell it that we want or we require um, authentication. So that's basically like the minus capital L minus M that we had in the get DNS query thing. Um, we tell it where it can find all the certificates that it needs to use. That's the trusted certificates that I mentioned earlier. These just exist in your system normally because the browser uses it. Um, and then you tell it your upstream name server. That's the .226 again that we just used. And um, like we did in the get DNS query thing, we need to tell it uh, the host name that that server is using. Alternatively, you can also uh, use this pin set in which case you first need to find out what your SPKI uh, value actually is. Um, that needs some open SSL magic again, L like there. I think at the basically what uh, once you're done with this, what falls out is a base64 encoded um, key hash. Um, and then you just take that, which is at the very bottom here, and put that into your stubby configuration. Um, you need to change the authentication method to, where is it? Oh, you just give it the, uh, oh yeah, so you use the, uh, you use the TLS pub key pin set there, um, set the digest method to uh, SHA-256 and give it the value. Um, you can also use Unbound as a TL DNS over TLS client. So normally, if you speak to your upstreams, that still happens in uh, with UDP or TCP in the clear, because there is no no method for uh, talking to the authoritative name servers over TLS just yet. Um, but you can use Unbound as a forwarder, and then um, you basically do the same thing. You tell it that uh, for the the whole zone, for the whole internet, basically, um, it should forward TLS and it should use this address. And here, instead of the tilde, it uses the, the hash um, to indicate the, the host name again. And much like we had to do for Stubby, we had to give it the paths for, for the certificates. 
Um, also, Android speaks uh, DNS over TLS. Um, right now, I think by default, it is still off. It might have, or, ah, okay, so they try um, 853 now by default. So if you have an Android phone and whatever name server you have configured actually speaks DOT, then it just tries to do this. Um, but you can also configure um, more, like you can tell it to actually use the host name, much like you see there. Uh, that's the same thing with the host name in the, uh, in the configuration. Um, if you run a DNS over TLS server, then your monitoring becomes a bit more important um, because if your certificate expires, well, that's the end of it. Um, but that's exactly the same as you should be doing for your web stuff anyway. So all the tools that you're using for, the, for, for your HTTPS uh, can also be used for DNS over TLS. An example here is um, if you just want to do it the old fashioned way with a little bit of scripting, um, then trust the old OpenSSL comes to hand again. Um, yes, so if you are doing um, the SPKI pinning thing, then um, what is very important, if you renew your certificate, you need to keep the private key so that that pin doesn't change and all your users need to change their pin. Um, so the way you do this is um, you can create a certificate signing request with uh, an OpenSSL command um, and then either use that one to create the certificate or uh, you ship it to, to uh, Let's Encrypt to uh, use that one instead of just creating stuff. Um, again, I guess that's basically, since you only do that every so often, either you script it or uh, you have to Google it at that point. Um, now, what we also can do, um, of course, because this is 2019, we put everything into HTTP. Um, that is a very new protocol. It was uh, turned into an RFC like a couple of weeks ago. Um, the idea here is that we take regular DNS payload and stick it into the body of an HTTP transaction. Um, it only has been specified for HTTP2 and also only has been specified for use with TLS. Um, the main advantage of this from a privacy perspective is that um, instead of using this dedicated port 853, it uses port 443 like every uh, any other HTTP traffic, which means it becomes even harder to distinguish traffic so um, if you use port H53, why they cannot find out anymore what you're asking for, at least whoever is listening in knows that you're doing DNS and they can block it. Um, here you can't really uh, know anymore whether you're doing DNS or some other web stuff. So um, if need be, you can hide your DNS traffic in regular, um, in regular uh, web traffic. Um, I think the other main, um, sort of incentive to doing this was that doing actual bare TLS is pretty hard for browser, for like JavaScripting in the browser, whereas HTTP they can just do because that's what they do. Um, so this uh, makes it easier to do some DNS things um, in your browser. And as we are doing more and more advanced things in the DNS, um, think about all these all these uh, records that we have for, for mail and things. Um, that becomes important to be able to uh, to do more things directly as JavaScript in the browser, which is also something that happens more and more. Um, and one advantage here is also that we understand HTTP traffic, especially the scaling issues on the server side very well by now because we do it a lot. Um, so instead of figuring all of this stuff out again for DNS or DNS over TLS, we can just use whatever the HTTP crowd came up with, um, which is quite an, ex uh, quite an uh, advantage, of course. Um, the drawback is that you have an entirely different protocol. If you do DNS over TLS, it's just DNS as we've already always done it. So uh, it's certainly easier to implement uh, on the client and also on the server side. Um, now the browser folks took this idea and, and ran with it um, and are starting to change a bit how DNS works. Um, you will remember that uh, we have this recursive resolver in the middle that actually does all the hard work in finding your finding your uh, answers. And 
normally what you do is you automatically get your recursive resolver uh, delivered to you via DHCP uh, by your network operator. So your recursive resolver is always operated by the network operator, um, which may or may not be a good thing. If you imagine you're in a, in a like a, a sort of in a co coffee shop and you're using the Wi-Fi there, then who knows what happens there. So um, the browser, f the browser uh, yeah, and there's also a problem that um, not all of these resolvers are actually well behaved, so they may not answer certain queries, they may break stuff. Um, so for advanced usages of DNS, you might want to actually use a res resolver that you know works and that you can trust. Um, so what they did is they invented a thing called a trusted recursive resolver, which is a list of public DNS resolvers or D DNS over HTTP resolvers that is built into your browser. And instead of using whatever DNS server your ISP gives you, they basically just use that. Um, which um, I think the, the one that already does this is, is uh, Firefox, not by default. Um, and they're using the Cloudflare one, which um, caused a bit of a stir. Um, because what it does is um, it bypasses local policies. So many people um, provide a recursive resolver and they also do some filtering and they do some stuff with this. Um, I think parental, parental controls and that sort of thing. And of course, if your uh, browser doesn't speak to this thing anymore, but does its own thing, then everything is being bypassed. Um, whether this is good or bad for privacy depends a bit on your perspective. Um, basically, can you do your, your uh, ISP to, uh, to not uh, record all your traffic and then sell it, like apparently the Americans like to do? Um, so in some scenarios, it's better to, to indeed use those resolvers. In other scenarios, you think it's probably better to uh, use, like say if you have your own resolver in your house that you run and you control, then you don't really need this and you probably want to use that one. Um, which takes us to the whole question of um, if you're running a resolver, um, how do you deal with privacy there? If you want to provide a, a resolver that is that is privacy aware, then you need to um, t uh, do a couple of things. Obviously, you don't want to log. Um, and if you log, you don't want to store it for very long. Um, also, because um, that resolver sees all the traffic, uh, you want to secure it a bit more. So don't let anyone just log in and start a Wireshark on that machine, something like that. Um, and if you do uh, log data, because for operational reasons, this is of course very, very, um, very nice to see, you know, where, what people do, which, you know, for an operator it's nice, but it's also a privacy thing. So what you can always there is um, try to anonymize data, um, although that is also a very hard problem. Um, as I said, there currently is no encryption between the resolver and the authoritative name servers. Um, that work has just started in the DeepRive working group. Um, the problem here is that uh, authentication becomes a bit more difficult. So obviously if you do encryption, you want to speak to the actual name server that you intend to. Um, there's a couple of ideas how to do this, um, but it's all very early. Uh, right now, so I think we we'll probably shouldn't talk about this. Um, and then one final note, um, which is now let's say you are a client and you have to figure out what is the best setup, uh, the best setup from a privacy perspective. Um, because there's now so many options. You could use the resolver that is provided by your network. You could use a public resolver. You could run your own uh, unbound somewhere that only you use. You can um, run unbound for you know a group of your friends. Um, all of this has uh, privacy impacts, um, which uh, if you if you are aware uh, if you want to be aware of that, you have to think about a bit. Um, so a local resolver, as I said, depends a bit on how much you can trust your ISP. Um, public public resolver similarly. Running a public resolver is a very good way to gather lo loads of data. Um, can you trust these guys to not do anything fishy with this? Um, and if you run your own unbound just for yourself, then actually you don't gain anything because uh, all the queries that this unbound will be doing actually will be your queries. So that doesn't help either. 
So um, what we thought might be the best is um, to use a mixture of all three. Um, so use your local resolver, use a set of public resolvers that you think you can trust. Um, possibly also have uh, your own resolver shared with a bunch of people. The more people, the better. And then um, sort of randomize between uh, like your queries, sort of spread them out over as many uh, resolvers as possible. And with that, we're sort of done. Um, do we have any questions? So yeah, again, for downstream queries, so for the queries coming from the stops, it does um, connection reuse already. For upstream, not yet. Um, I'm not aware of the existence of that data. We at the, we don't have it. Yeah. Well, that's that's handled by our TCP stack already, right? So that's in your in your machine already. So for us, it's just sending a extra socket option. So it's it's very easy for us to do, and there is it, it, it's somewhat limited the gain you get indeed. But since it's so easy to do anyway, there's not really a reason to. Uh, Um, within the context of privacy, we want to get better TCP performance. Um, so what we gain by using TCP fast open is we save one round trip for the um, for the handshake when we when a connection is closed, right? So if it's as long as connection is open, you don't do the handshake. But if it's closed because the server was busy or because it timed out or for for a reason like that, um, you want to use the same. Um, connection again probably because you just have a very limited set of resolvers configured so it's very likely that you contact the one that you already know and in that case you don't have to do the extra round trip for the handshake yeah and also um, so it's, it's I think it's more efficient actually for the for the server side okay. because they don't need to keep so many connections open and um, connections actually are expensive in terms of memory particularly if you do TLS on top of it then it gets quite expensive because you have to keep state and stuff um, so they probably, as a server, I probably don't want to have too many connections open. Um, and I mean, depending on the client, uh, DNS traffic can be very sporadic or can be, so it comes in bursts normally. So uh, you keep the connection open and then when, when they're done, you can shut it down and uh, you can reopen it later with, with uh, very little effort. So that's, I think it's mostly a scalability thing because people are always very scared if you move a protocol from UDP to TCP that the servers won't scale, which normally actually isn't the case in practice, but you know. So um, I think that's mostly the, the, the advantage of this. Well, first of all, we don't have DNS over HTTP and unbound much. I think we will do it eventually, since a lot of people would like to do it. 
Um, but for the TCP and the normal traffic, you can have both of them in the same daemon. So you can just listen on both ports 53 and 853 as possible. just worse. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. We haven't considered different techniques for the reverse um, tree. Might be interesting, though. I think with the um, fallbacks we have right now, it seems to work quite well. So, not sure if it's it's worth it. Okay. So, thank you, everyone, for coming. If you want unbound stickers, we have stickers. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I guess with that, we're done. Thank you very much.